Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening and welcome to Winchester Guildhall. Welcome to the 120 centre-right, anti-federalist, conservative politicians from around Europe who make up the AECR. And welcome to my many Conservative Party members and activists from Hampshire and other parts of the home counties. Uh, we're meeting here in Winchester, uh, Alfred's ancient capital, a town that has as good a claim as any to be the birthplace of English national consciousness and therefore the birthplace of freedom globally. Uh, and we're meeting at an extremely happy time. An extremely happy time for the AECR, but also, of course, an extremely happy time for British Conservatives. I have... <clears throat> I have a private theory that, by and large, the voters get it right. They tend to elect the party that most deserves it, or at least to throw out the party that most deserves to be thrown out. And even when we've lost, if we're honest, there's usually been a reason for it. I think sometimes that the profoundest conservative truth ever spoken was that sublime observation by the American conservative Bill Buckley when he said that he would rather be governed by the first thousand names chosen at random from the Boston telephone directory than by the economics faculty of Harvard University. Well, even... Um, even in the most literal sense, that was obviously true because, uh, by and large, the central banks of the last 10 years have been run by graduates of Harvard University. And so he was, he was right, even in the most technical sense. But the wisdom in crowds. Now, I don't know about you. I'm addressing really my fellow British conservatives here. There were moments during that campaign when I was really doubting my theory. I was watching the opinion polls apparently stagnant. And I was coming close to questioning the sturdy good sense of my fellow countrymen. And that is not a comfortable position for any politician to find himself in. <clears throat> There's something risible. Do you remember Dennis Skinner after the 1983 defeat by Labour saying there must be no compromise with the electorate? There is nothing worse than a politician feeling that he has to blame the country. But, of course, as it turned out, our fellow countrymen turned out to be wiser than the experts, as usual. They understood, even if the professionals and the commentators and the pundits didn't, that debts have to be settled, that the public sector has to be paid for by a growing economy, that there is a limit to public expenditure set by the amount of money available rather than by some random hard-heartedness or sadism, and they understood the appeal and the value of our trusted national institutions. And so I think those are good truths for all of our conservative friends here from all over Europe. And it explains why we in the Alliance of European Conservatives and Reformists are also growing. We are the fastest growing of the transnational European alliances. We admitted two new member parties today, we received applications for three more, and we are with the grain of public opinion in Europe. Our creed of free nations, free peoples, and free markets has elemental and eternal appeal. If you want to understand in one sentence what happened at the British general election, and if you want to understand why conservatives in Europe and the world generally will win, I can do no better than to quote that great Irish, Irish sage and seer Edmund Burke, who in his reflections on the French Revolution in 1790 exactly predicted the 2015 general election in Britain. <laughs> he observed the way in which uh, loud and morally bullying pundits could force the majority of people into a kind of uncomfortable silence, but they couldn't impose their will. And this is what he said. He said, because Half a dozen grasshoppers concealed beneath a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink, while thousands of great cattle take their repose beneath the shade of the British oak and chew the cud in silence. Pray do not imagine 
that those who make all the noise are the only inhabitants of the field. That's what happened on polling day, and that's why Conservatives will keep winning. So you're all very welcome. It's a real pleasure uh, for my party members to see uh, that we have allies in Europe, that we're not isolated. We sometimes, at the back of our minds, I think, have that, uh, uh, that picture of the famous low cartoon in 1940 of the, the, the British soldier shaking his fist from the white cliffs of Dover into the murk, and the caption was very well alone. Well, we weren't alone even then. There were patriots and freedom fighters in every part of the continent who believed in national independence, in democracy, and in representative government, and they were on our side. And we're not alone now. We have in every country decent conservatives who believe in the independence of their own country and therefore value the freedom of ours and every other. And that's the basis of the AECR. So thank you all for coming. Now, it is a huge pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker of the conference, the Lord Chancellor Michael Gove. I'm particularly going to address my fellow politicians in the room, of whom there are many. You perhaps know, as no civilian will ever understand, the tension between going into politics to achieve concrete results and going into politics to appear to have done your best. You will know how easy it is to vote the right way, to make the right noises, to give the right interviews, and to put yourself in a position where you are impeccable, where nobody will say, well, he didn't try. And you will know, as I know, but as, as I think perhaps those who don't practice politics can only begin to guess, how unusual, how rare is the practitioner of our vocation who goes into politics only with the agenda of making concrete and tangible changes to the world around him. If that's how we measure success in politics, I can think of no more successful British politician today than Michael Gove. In the last parliament, in the last parliament, Michael served as education secretary. And for the first time in my life, instead of exam results improving while standards dropped, for the first time the opposite happened. The grade inflation stopped, but the employers and the universities noticed an improvement in standards. And we began to creep up the international league tables. And that happened because there was a minister who was prepared to take on the inevitable vested interests, what Milton Friedman calls the tyranny of the status quo, that prevent reform in any department. And there is a price to be paid when you do that. You're blackguarded, traduced, your reputation is destroyed. But Michael never forgot that he was there to serve the children of this country, our own sons and daughters, to make the education system responsive to the needs of the public rather than to be a champion of the producers. And if you think about it, that's what a minister is there to do. He's there to remind the permanent apparatus of the state that they are there to serve the rest of us rather than the other way around. And he now has, like so many successful politicians, promoted himself into even more trouble <laughs> because he now has to do the same job with our legal establishment, reasserting the sublime principle of parliamentary supremacy in the face of judicial activism and our subordination before the European Court of Human Justice and uh, 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 European Court of Human Rights. And I'll tell you, if you think that the National Union of Teachers were a troublesome and obstreperous opponent, you have seen nothing until you have seen my learned friends really training their fire on someone. But I know that if anyone is in a position to effect the changes we need, to restore functioning democracy in this country, to restore honor and purpose and value to the act of voting, it's our next speaker, the new Lord Chancellor, Michael Gove. Bismarck once said, politics is the art of the possible. And ever since then, there have been all too many politicians who've taken that as an instruction 
not to deliver. There have been all too many politicians who thought, ah, the art of the possible. That means compromise. It means trimming. It means, before I enter any negotiation, acknowledging that I will probably come out with far less than I would hope and my friends would ask for. I believe that politics is not the art of the possible. Politics is about demanding that which the people deserve and what you know in your heart to be right and daring, daring events in history to prove you wrong. If you believed that politics was just the art of the possible, then you would never have thought that David Cameron, after only five years in the House of Commons, when he was up against figures like David Davis and Kenneth Clark and Malcolm Rifkind, could possibly have become the leader of the Conservative Party. But there were some people who thought that David had what it took, that his analysis of what was wrong with the Conservative Party and his vision of what was required were absolutely right, and he would become not only the leader of our party, but also a prime minister, and a prime minister worthy of respect, a prime minister capable of securing a conservative majority government. And when David set out to become leader of the Conservative Party, there were some politicians who held back to wait to see how he would perform. But there were some politicians who instantly saw that he had what it took. And one of those politicians was, of course, Daniel Hannan. Because Daniel has always understood that in politics, you should never be constrained by what the conventional opinion says is possible. You should always strive to do the right thing. And by doing the right thing, then there can be no limit to what you can achieve. I began by quoting Bismarck. Daniel's no Bismarck. Daniel, to my mind, is rather closer to William Pitt the Younger. He has Pitt's good looks. He was, like Pitt, catapulted to the forefront of politics when he was still in his 20s. And also, as was said of William Pitt, Daniel has saved his country by his exertions and Europe by his example. Because it was Daniel's exertions. His efforts in making sure that many of us recognize that David Cameron was the person to lead not just our party but our country that helped ensure that we would have a conservative majority government now that we can celebrate. It was Daniel's exertions in order to ensure that we had an absolute ironclad commitment to a referendum on our future in the European Union at the heart of our election campaign that ensured that we were in a position to win and to win back the confidence of the British people. And it was also Daniel's exertions which ensured that we created a new group in the European Parliament, that we weren't constrained by those who said only do what is possible. We created in this group here, the Association of European Conservatives and Reformists, a new group which didn't have to pay lip service to outdated and inappropriate and untrue notions about federalism, but could instead argue freely and forcefully for free markets, free institutions, free peoples, and as a result, could move from having been a gleam in the eye of a few visionaries into the third largest and fastest growing group in the European Parliament, and perhaps the greatest force for reform and progress in the European continent that there is at the moment. So those exertions and that example are a lesson to all of us. And the exertions and the example of Daniel, as a member of the European Parliament, has also been matched by the energy I know of many members of Parliament who were elected or re-elected just two weeks ago here in Hampshire. When I was uh, selected as a candidate in Surrey Heath uh, in 2004, Hampshire was a county in which the Liberal Democrats, if you can imagine such a thing, <laughs> were on the advance. From Portsmouth South to Winchester itself, huge swathes of this, the second most beautiful county in England, <laughs> had the misfortune to be represented by Liberal Democrats. But now, just a few years later, where once Liberal Democrats had a 20,000 majority in this constituency, now Steve Brine is in an unassailable electoral position, thanks to his efforts. We have fantastic new MPs, 
like Flick Drummond and Mims Davis, who scored huge and wonderful victories just a fortnight ago. We have hmm? fantastic victories. We have wonderful, talented new MPs like Alan Mack and Havant, and my great friend Damien Hines, who's now been promoted to be a Treasury Minister. And Hampshire has become, to my mind, the nursery of future conservative talent. And as a result of that, we're in a stronger position than ever before in Parliament to ensure that the people who voted for us have a team capable of delivering. And one of the things that I know that we have to deliver is a fundamental reform of our relationship, of Britain's relationship with the European Union. And the exertions that the Prime Minister will devote to that task are driven not just by a desire to get a better deal for Britain and to fulfill our manifesto promises, but also by a desire to transform Europe for the better. And that is why the negotiation that the Prime Minister leads has been supported, I know, by people across the European Union and is bolstered by the goodwill, the friendship, the solidarity of all those who are within the AECR. Now, the Prime Minister, when he went to uh, Riga today, was perfectly clear that the scale of what he's asking for was meant that uh, he wasn't met with a universal wave of smiles and friendship and good humor. But we all knew that. But in the same way as David overcame the initial skepticism and hostility that greeted his decision to run for the Conservative leadership, in the same way as David overcame the consensus of commentators that said that we could not win a majority at this election, I'm convinced that David and his team can secure a transformation of the European Union, and not before time. As Daniel pointed out, we're here in the, uh, the ancient capital of England. We meet 800 years after Magna Carta was signed. We know that the values which have made democracies successful across not just the European Union but in the Anglosphere, the values which make them successful have been the rule of law and an adherence to democracy. And we know that the European Union in its original incarnation was designed to uphold the principles of the rule of law and democratic accountability. But we also know all too sadly that there have been occasions in the European Union when the rule of law has been set aside. When the European Commission has deliberately broken the rules which were there to guide it and which were designed to make sure that it was a healthy and functioning political entity. We also know, all too sadly, that there have been occasions when democratic principles have not been respected within the European Union, when individual nations have voted against the accretion of power to the centre through referenda, and those referenda votes have been overridden. And what has been a non, or a nay, or a no, has been steamrolled into a reluctant strangulated and acquiescent yes, as the Brussels steamroller has insisted that there can only be one way their way. I believe that we now have in David, a Prime Minister, in Daniel and in all of you, supporters, and in the cause of renegotiation, an opportunity at last to secure for the people of Europe what it is that they have always wanted. Free trade, cooperation, all the advantages of democracies working together to act as a force for good on the world stage. But without the erosion of the rule of law, the undermining of democracy, and the distant rule of elites who regard themselves as beyond the realm of accountability, which unfortunately has marked out the European Union during most of my adult lifetime. It's a historic opportunity it's an opportunity that history will not forgive us for fudging or failing to grasp. And that is why I think even as we celebrate tonight, as we celebrate the fantastic election victory that the Conservatives have secured in the United Kingdom, as we raise a glass to all our friends from across the European Union and beyond who share our vision, our belief in the rule of law, in free markets, in free peoples, in democracy, even as we celebrate tonight, 
let's also dedicate ourselves to the struggle to come. Let's make sure that the arguments aren't left to the Prime Minister and to ministers and governments, but that a genuine people's movement stands behind that fight for change. And let's make sure that we are optimistic about what we can achieve. Because as I mentioned earlier, if we think only that politics is the art of the possible, if we allow ourselves to be constrained by the judgments of the commentators, then we will falter and we will fail. And it is so important that we restore democracy and prosperity to our continent that we cannot falter and that we cannot fail. Which is why tonight I thank all of you for the efforts that you have devoted to advancing the principles in which we all believe and why I pledge all the energy at my disposal to ensuring that we do win and that we do secure the renegotiation of the European Union that we all want to see in the interests of its peoples at last. Thank you. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for inspiring us. We sometimes have a vice in this country, a besetting national failure, which is to take our eyes off what is happening across the channel until it's almost too late. Well, this time, if there is anyone who can advance the principles that you just brilliantly adumbrated, it's you, our fellow Conservative ministers, and our friends, auxiliaries, and allies around Europe, dedicated to the cause of free peoples, free nations, and free markets. And to remind you of that cause, I would like to present you with our AECR tie, so that every time you go and do battle in Europe, you'll remember that you are not alone. You have friends on every part of the continent. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. It is, it is rather magnificent, and ever since I first saw Geoffrey Clifton Brown wearing one, I wondered how I might get one, and that's why I've come here this evening, so thank you.